here we go. It's Eve and Fulcher August Jack. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Irish Influence. And this um, is Shockton Le Poring. This is St. Patrick's Week, I think, and we've got a guest here who will know something about those things and everything relating to him. And that is Monacan McGann. Very, very welcome, Monacan. Monacan is a writer and a documentary maker and I suppose a television personality. And maybe above all, actually, I suppose we know him as a Gael Gore. He's made over 30 travel documentaries focusing on uh, world cultures and on globalization. You presented No Barrel, a documentary series about traveling around Ireland, speaking only Irish. You're a uh, travel columns for the Irish Times. You have a couple of books, novels, I think, written in the Irish language. And your most recent book, the one that I think we're certainly going to talk about, among other things, is called 32 Words for a Field, Lost Words of the Irish Landscape. So very welcome, Monica. And thank you very much. Lovely to see you. Thank you so much, Joe. Thanks, Mike. Nice to talk to you. Great, great, great. And I guess I suppose I'll start off by reminding everybody that uh, Throwing your questions there in the chat or in the Q&A, and we'll get around to them as the, uh, as the evening or the afternoon, depending on where you are, actually progresses. And uh, again, I'm going to just start by thanking the consulate very, very much for their help in, in setting this up and for uh, allowing us to go forward. So um, the first question I want to put to you, Monica, and again, actually, is perhaps uh, about your strange and Rather wonderful name. Can you tell us Monaghan McGann, where that came from or what that's about, please, maybe? Yeah, so Monaghan, um, basically my family were these, either they were revolutionaries, Republican revolutionaries, or they were Celtic scholars. They were the two ah. sides of them. The intellectual ones were the Celtic scholars. I'm afraid I don't come from that lineage. I come from the, the sort of rebel terrier warriors, Theo O'Reilly and all that. But his first cousin was T.F. O'Reilly and Cecil O'Reilly. And Cecil O'Reilly did the first, like, the proper translation of the Tyne Book Coilne in the 60s and started in the 50s. And then T.F. O'Reilly would have done primary research uh, on sort of early Irish texts, um, on poetry in the 1910s and 20s. And Cecil O'Reilly was had given the job by my mother to go out and find great names for, for all of her children. And hmm. so she would give sources to my mother and my mother would search through them. And one of the names was Monaghan. Monaghan, there was a sixth century saint, one in Offaly and one in Kerry uh, with these names. And both of them have their oratory still in existence, their little stone chapel. Um, but I particularly, I mean, we, I have roots with West Kerry. So I like that St. Monaghan. I liked his holy well and his little chapel. But then I also like the Offaly St. Monaghan, I've only just realized is connected to the Rudriga family of County Down. And maybe if there's a chance, I might talk to you later about the Rudriga wave. Um, this is this ancient, ancient tribal family that the Offaly St. Monaghan goes back to. So since those same sixth century Monaghans, there haven't really been any other ones. Like Monaghan probably means little monk. So in, he, they're alive in the sixth century. Then there's a cult, a romantic cult to them in the 12th century. And then the name dries out. And I think I'm the only Monaghan now. I think that I know one or two people with a second name of Monaghan, but I think I'm the only person at the moment with a first name. And it'll die with me because it's a, it's my brothers, my family, my brothers and sisters have nice names, but nobody really wants to take on Mon Khan or Monaghan. Who says that you haven't popularized it? There could be babies even at this very moment being <laughs> baptized Monaghan all over the place. It sounds like you've got connections in various parts of Ireland. And now at the moment you're living in Westmead, you have as many connections as Charlie Hockey, who belonged, I think, to the entire country up, up and down. Um, and your 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 fame, your 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 fame, you're known in Ireland, of course, actually, for your various colourful enterprises relating to the Irish language, but you've had a pre-Gaelic life. You lived on the other side of the Atlantic for some time. Do you want to just give us a little bit of background on that, maybe? Yeah, so although I was brought up in Dublin, in Donnybrook and Dublin, I would have spent a lot of time in my time in West Kerry. I found life in Ireland in the 70s and 80s very narrow. So mm -hmm. I ran as quick as I could. I went off to Africa on a truck for about eight months in 1989. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up in, in South America um, mm -hmm. working on a farm. In fact, running an organic uh, hostel on a farm on the Ecuadorian Peruvian border. And I spent mm -hmm. maybe two years there. And then I happened to go, well, I came back to Ireland to work on some organic farms, but then I ended up in British Columbia, up in the Kootenai Mountains, where it was legal at the time to grow cannabis. So I was growing, well, no, I wasn't. We, the farm, the community was growing organic cannabis, and I was looking after the children. 
Um, and I did that for about a year until eventually I ended up in India, which sort of my sort, this sort of lost dreamer um, person who doesn't fit anywhere, eventually ends up in the Himalayas. Um, and yeah, and then I sort of had sense and came back here. Right. right. One thing, I mean, I see from all that traveling, especially formative years, the places you went, they're off the beaten track. This is not normal kind of backpacking life. From what you described there, it really feeds into many of the themes that come out in your own work, in your travels, kind of environmentalism, kind of landscape, mm. uh, looking at the planet and so on. Was, was that something you traveled with or something you really kind of picked up while you were journeying? Yeah. So, like, when I was a kid, I had my own herb garden. I was one of these people who only... Life only made sense to me when I was grounded in nature and the, mm. the rest of the world didn't really make sense. So I wanted to find other people doing that. And, and so after, straight after, I did one year in college in UCD doing Irish and history and German, I think, um, early Irish mainly, and um, early Irish history. And um, I, went to, I went to Africa and the minute I arrived there and saw people living this sort of almost medieval or perhaps like Bronze Age life um, of sustainable farming, simple farming, cooking outside on a fire, making your own clothing or bartering. That made sense to me. And I realized all the sites, the ancient sites we had seen in Ireland that my parents had brought me around to, that life that was lived in those, any site from like for the last 2000 years, was still being lived in parts of Africa. And that, I found that really reassuring. So then I went to South America, found the same thing in India. And then, then in 1996, I had done maybe eight years of travel and TG Carr came along, um, this you know, brand new television station because there was some money in the country. Um, Charlie Haw had some money and Michael D. Higgins particularly decided uh, there should be a, um, an Irish language station. So I returned to all those places that I'd gone with this ecological interest then looking at a, with a cultural mindset. And so TG Carr, its mission statement was Sul Ella, another eye, looking at things from a marginal perspective, which being a, a marginal language, being a small native rooted people give you this connection. And so then I went and met, you know, the Tarahumaran Indians in, in Mexico, or the Yami people in Lanyu Island, or the Masu people in the far province of Yunnan, or the Berbers, or the Bedouins, in fact, all over the world, the like Inuits in Greenland, we just made documentaries on all of these tribal people. And that made me realize, not only are the ways that we're living, the ways that I was interested in, in farming, organically rooted to the soil, were they absolutely international and still a key part of Ireland, but also this sort of in um, native indigenous mindset that I had seen all over the world in these edge communities um, struggling, holding on despite the mass movement of globalization and commerce, that they all had an interlinking theme that was also back home in that West Kerry, the Guelta community of, in the West of Ireland that I had fortunately been, been introduced to in my youth. That's very lovely, Monica, and I, I like that very much, actually, that you're talking about the Irish language not simply as a little precious thing that it is, but seeing its almost universality in kind of ways. That's, that's, that's very touching. Um, and let's just talk about the language it, itself, because, I mean, there'd be a good number of people out here watching who would know little enough about the language. And so one or two of the basic facts. How ancient is it? Um, um, I, how far back does it go? Is it the language of the Gael? How long has it been in Ireland? And a couple of small things like that, just about its uniqueness, or is it that unique at all? Mm -hmm. So is it unique first? No, it's not at all unique if you bring it among the group of ancient languages. If you think of, of Arabic, of Sanskrit, of Hebrew, of Estrangelo, any of Sumerian even, or any of the great ancient languages that had their own impact, that had their own power, that had their own way of seeing the world, a non-logical, a non-rational, a non-limited way of seeing the world. All of those ancient languages have things in common. And so in Irish is no way unique, but it is very different from other European languages, which are modern, which, which went through the Renaissance, which went through the Industrial Revolution. And so they are this, the modern languages of Europe, French, German, English, Spanish, they are very efficient. They are incredibly practical. They are beautiful um, forms of communication. But the, 
the ancientness, the almost the, the dead, the ancient DNA that goes with a really old animal and old being an old language is something else entirely. And where did the Irish language come from? It's an Indo-European language. So that was its root. This language that was spoken in between Europe and Asia, that spread west to Europe and then east to parts of Asia, and that is still being spoken. So you are finding that you're going to find so many words in the Irish language that are almost identical to words in, in Hindu in the, in, that are still part of that culture. Mm -hmm. When did it arrive in Ireland? It arrived in Ireland with the arrival of what we call the Celts, these people who had a, a particular style, a particular mindset, a Celtic idea, and that came in either eight. 800 BC or 500 BC. So it's been spoken in this country for 2,000 years, two and a half thousand years, or 2,800 years. And possibly Irish might have a lot of the words that we, the people of Ireland, first arrived here in the Bronze Age. I mean, my DNA did. There were people here before us who built Newgrange and all. They weren't us. They were wiped out. The hunter-gatherers who were before the people who built the great Newgrange and the great Mesolithic tombs, they have died out. I have no trace of those hunter-gatherers. I have an infinitesimal trace of, in, of those hunter-gatherers in me. I have a tiny trace of the, the Neolithic people, the people who built the great monuments. But I might also have some, some of the words that the people who arrived here nine, 10,000 years ago, when the great ice sheet was a treating off the land and the land was rising after the last ice age, possibly some of those words that they said were passed down despite the fact that their DNA went, you know, because languages can jump things, or maybe not. The one thing we're sure, it's, it's at least two and a half thousand years old that has been spoken in this, in this country. You're saying that we have some of those words, but you also seem to be saying that we have some of that sensibility. You're, you're distinguishing between Irish and, and some of these, what you call the efficients and the rational languages. Are you actually saying that there's a, that there's a different way of thinking that's coming that Irish people have because of, because of the language? Is, am I here? Somewhere I'm here. Yeah. So if you're dealing with these old languages that believed in almost a form of animism, that there was a God in everything, in every raindrop, in every leaf, in every gust of wind, that the, the divine was always present, then that by nature is going to be a very different language to modern languages who believe in rational objective reality and only what we see with our own eyes. By, mm. by dint of it, they will, they're thoroughly different things. Mm. And so like, people always think that Irish, the Irish language is almost crippled by Christianity that they say, you know, you cannot be an atheist or, uh, and speak Irish because to say, you know, dear is uh, hello, you know, God bless you. Um, Tom, oh, you know, um, like, uh, what, <laughs> um, luckily would be our um, lacoon of day with the help of God. There's no, there's so many phrases that are impregnated with the word God. And so we think this is, mm. this is a Christian limitation, but it's not. The Irish took on that word day or dia. So the word in, in um, today is in you, in you, in you, in dio, in God. The word yeah, for yesterday is in a, again, it's in day, in God. God is everywhere. And people think it's a Christian God. It's not. That word dia, deus, they took it from the Latin um, because it was, you know, when Christianity came in the fifth century, we, they brought in this idea of deus and dia. But that word is cognate with the deus of um, the divas of India. It's the same word, the divas, that God. It's the same, that deus is the same word as Zeus. So it is a language which sees both God everything, everywhere and also the other world everywhere. So I give the example of the word counter and altar. And counter means a region, a place, a district. But there was always uh, an understanding that the opposite of counter was altar. And altar, if, if counter means this place, this region, this district, altar means the other world. And there was always only a thin veil between counter and altar. And there were people who could leap from one to the other. So yeah, I would definitely say that it is, there's a mindset that goes with it. This. Wow. And is, it is it also not a mindset that's rooted again to the kind of the ideas of the land? I mean, I was, I was watching the other day on BBC Four or something, it's got a series on the history of Welsh art. And they stride through the valleys, and it's very beautiful, very beautiful. Um, clearly a Welsh presenter, but presenting in English. 
And a friend of mine who's a Welsh speaker said, you know, it would be so much better in Welsh because English doesn't have the words. And I always think with this, when you kind of think of Tim Robinson backwards, some of your own work, that when you, that idea of the two worlds, but there's also the idea of the lived landscape the Irish have occupied for X thousand years that the language grows up in, that you do yeah. have this kind of nuance of place names are rooted in landscape. They're rooted in things that happened there. It's, it's, it's much more nuanced in English. I mean, is that a virtue, again, of that kind of long history of the ways in which people lived? And again, that worldview, that the place they live is both mystical, religious, God-driven, etc. Yeah, exactly. Again, it's like that metaphor of the um, junk DNA. So if you get a tree that is truly ancient, like a monkey puzzle, or you get a woodlouse or a cockroach, they have built up all of this extra DNA from experience. So if you have one people who have been living on the same island for, you know, for four and a half, for 5,000 years, and have been using this language for two and a half to 3,000 years, years and maybe some of those previous language are in this language you are going to get this specificity you are going to get this absolute rootedness in which there are you know what well, my book is called 32 words for fields in which you're going to have at least 32 words for a field you're going to have rain and upland field you'll have bronner of fallow field you'll have buroch a marshy field you'll have townach which is an arid field in an ar an arable field field in an arid area you'll have mon there an open field machra a closed field, you'll have moon, mean, a smooth field, you'll have lusset, a uh, neat, well-arranged field, you'll have bonog, a field made level by years of dancing. You will have this built-up knowledge, this, this, in, in this, um, this elementalism. And this is something we see in all indigenous cultures. This is why that great cliche of, you know, the Inuits and snow. Um, if you have a people who absolutely depend on their surroundings for their daily existence and who have done so and lived in a sustainable way for thousands of years, you are going to have this language. So again, there's nothing exceptional about Irish, mm. but, but just take, for example, so last year I did a project. I spent uh, most of the year looking at the coastline, talking to old fishermen and good God, the, the richness of words I got from people from the fish, from, from fishermen. And of course, these are people who have absolutely depended for their existence on, on the coast for, you know, for thousands of years. And we often think, we often wonder why during the famine did the Irish starve when there was all that shellfish, all that seaweed, all that fish along the coastline. And uh, we think, was it, was it, you know, were they bone idle? Were they lazy? Were they ignorant? And you just ask a fisherman for, for the, the specificity of the words, um, like a caracal, a thick piece of plank or a balk found on the, on the land, or a, a rock havoc, which is the which is the rotten mix of seaweed that's found in certain caves that is then dragged up uh, onto the shore. I mean, there's so many different words for seaweed. So it's just natural when people depend on their surroundings, you're going to get that that wealth. That's really beautiful. So if I'm hearing it there, it, it's something. It's not just that they have a grander. A, a breadth of vocabulary, so to speak, but there's some way in which that actually has produced the Irish character, the Irish character itself, that we are suited to the language and the language is suited to us, or is that too far to go? No, I mean, it's a perfect, the, uh, the language is a perfect definition of our concerns uh, for, you know, for the last few millennia, and they have been survival um, and working in a community on the land and noticing with incredible accuracy the different um, weather patterns and different weather systems. Like Kalyantorov means weather forecasting for fishermen, but it's by not noticing natural signs. So noticing there is a Madaguiha, a small rainbow that's stuck that's sticking up from the sea on the other side um, of, of the rainbow, sort of a beam of light that, that sort of predicts bad weather. So you have that specificity. And then because we have always been dreamers, just as you know, just as probably all people pre-modern age had this, they, they had this consciousness that was able to expand, that was able, necessary, that could focus on tasks, but seemed to have been, tied into something bigger. And, and is that just a generality? No, why was there always a spiritual manifestation, even from the, the cave paintings long ago? We seem to have that two sides of us. We would want to expand out of our mind into a more vague universal thinking. And then 
We need it, again, from the bog bodies we see, we need it really specific information about how to survive and how each tree, each rock had a different use and a different way of, of, um, of, of being utilized for our good. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. both of those are the two elements of the Irish language. Very earthy, very elemental, very specific, mm -hmm. and then extremely otherworldly. And that's really the Irish. That's really beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Can I take from that, that um, is there any suggestion then that were we to, to, to reclaim the language or that those who become fluent in the language, that it expands in some way their consciousness, that it gives them insights that are otherwise closed off to those mere English speakers around? What's the bonus or is that too much to ask? <laughs> no, it, I mean, it definitely changes your way of thinking about things. And um, I, I, I give the example of something my grandmother said to me long, long ago that basically blew my mind. And it was a proverb. You know, there are so many proverbs in Irish. But this proverb was, Sail me, sail chi vil vord, sail umid avon, sail tree umid sail um down. So sail tree vil vord, sail umid avon, the life of three whales is the life of one growing ridge, one cultivation ridge. Mm. Now, a whale, they thought, we thought in Ireland live for a thousand years. They actually live for about a hundred years. But so, so the life of three whales is the life of one growing ridge. So the life of three whales as 3,000 years is the life of one cultivation ridge, a growing ridge. Now, anybody who comes to Ireland will see the lazy beds, the old famine potato ridges on the mountains. When, you know, we had 8 million people here and every single patch of land needed to be cultivated. And you see those ridges because when the potato blight came, either the, the people were too weak to, 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 to dig them, or otherwise they saw the rot, they saw the stalks rot, and they knew there was no point in, in, in digging them. So the, some of those ridges are just the actual ridges from the 1840s. Others are just that they would have, you know, for centuries, they would have been growing cultivations on those crops. And so the lines, these corrugations in the, in the, in the, in the land um, continue. But in some places, like, for example, in the Cade of Fields, in Val Derrick, up in Mayo, and in the in Schlieve Moor, in, in Ackle, you will see cultivation ridges just like that. But they're not from 150 years ago. They are from three, 4,000 years ago. They are the ancient Neolithic or sort of Bronze Age, sorry, Bronze Age um, growing Terms. Some of them are 3,000 years old. So the, when the proverb says the, say, the life of three whales is the life of three um, of one cultivation ridge, it is accurate. It's 3,000 years old. And what's the second part of that proverb? Sail tree vil vord, sail umid avon. Sail tree umid, sail and down. The life of three cultivation ridges is the life of the world. Now, as I said, those cultivation ridges we know from archaeology are 3,000 years old. Um, as the proverb did. The Irish people seem to know that. And so they're saying the life of three of those, 9,000 years, is the life of the world. Now, it just happens that we know that the last ice age ended here. The humans arrived after the last ice age nine or 10,000 years ago. That mindset was in the Irish mind. Like mm -hmm. that is an, that's an, an, an almost an Aboriginal way of understanding the world. That is very different from a modern European or, or North American insight in the world and that is the sort of thing that you get if you if you tune into any of the old native elemental languages probably native is a bad word to use these days no. I think that's in, just pick, picking up on that i think that's the amazing thing i mean you look at something like the folklore commission in uh, records in ucd where you have this huge collection in, from second half of 19th into the 20th century where people were still living in this kind of verbal non-written world where the phrases they had um those ideas were multi multi multi-generational passed down and i think it is it's fascinating when you look at them about how many of them when you look at them first and think that's very sweet that's very cute what does it mean but as you say it actually starts when you start figuring out or in my case somebody explained it to you they actually have a kind of an understanding to them of the cosmos of the uh, of kind of lived human history, mm -hmm. which is remarkable in a way that in a way our boring written records don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, we are only beginning to touch on the wisdom in the old myths. The myths and sagas um, look like they are farcical. They look like they are totally over the top. These accounts of Cuchulain and and Finn McCool and the great warrior heroes, and yet. So this year, I made a TV series for TG Carr, or last year, called DNA Kailta, about the ancient DNA. And it's on the, the TG Carr website. 
um, a three-part series. But one of the first ones we did, we looked at Newgrange and we looked at this site of this, you know, which is a Neolithic site from what, 5,000 years ago. Uh, yeah. Um, and five and a half thousand years ago even. And um, in the central chamber of Newgrange, they found bones. So the bones of the most important person there, the king, the regal figure, the divine figure, their bones were there. And of course, now with DNA, we are able to analyze those. So we analyze them and they find, to find the hardest bone first, the petrous bone behind the ear. Luckily, one of those bones was, was found when Newgrange was excavated in the mid, mid 20th century. And um, they, they analyzed it and they found uh, in Trinity College, Professor Dan Bradley did a full spectrum analysis and realized something strange that, that this king, this regal figure in the central point of Newgrange, he was the offspring of incest. His parents were brother and sister or father and son or for, you know, father and daughter or something. Um, but they were, he was definitely the offspring of incest. Now, in one way, that's not too odd because you find that in Egyptian culture too. Obviously, the pharaohs in Egypt were 1,000, 1,500 after Newgrange. But nonetheless, that idea of keeping the divine presence, that the king was a, had, a, had a divine element, was a god, um, you, keep that, you keep that there. All very good. That's, that's just research. But you go back to any of the old sagas of, K, of Lug, of the great gods um, passing by and battling in, in um, Newgrange. Just look at any of them. And so often you will have the case that Cumar Amor, who was the king who lived, they said, who lived there, or, or Angus's son, or whoever was in, in one of the big citadels in Newgrange, that either they're suddenly seen to be, um, that there, someone, someone is named as their wife, and then she's named as their, his daughter as well. Or a father will suddenly be a son. And there, there's constant these nuances of, of incest, of unnatural sexual of engagements. And we always would have thought that that was just the farcical element of mythology. Like we know that the Irish took the great stories of the Greek legend, Homer and uh, the Odyssey and all, and just added their own things that they liked. Not sexed them up, added way more um, beheadings and skulls because the Irish mm -hmm. loved beheadings and skulls. So we just thought, okay, these accounts of, of incest were just a sort of a sexual peccadillo of the Celts. Not at all. This was a memory going back 5,000 years, uh, potentially, potentially. But yeah, there is so much more to look in the folklore and to realize what's the extra, what can we learn from those folklore, as you said, that is all sitting in UCD that is now being digitized and is available to all of us on the duchas.ie website. What can we learn about medical history, about female shamanic rituals, about m mushrooms and psychedelic journeys? All of those ideas that we know were part of native tribes are probably encoded still in the mythology, in the folklore. It's just waiting for us to explore. Wow. That's really marvelous, uh, Monica. And as I gather from what you're saying, not just learning about the past through this, but learning about ourselves and perhaps enabling us to escape from the narrow confines, if I'm hearing it properly, of the modern way of thinking, that this might open gates to us. I want to go back for a few seconds just to the, the richness as well as the complexity of the Irish language. And the complexity, of course, is the thing that, that stops so many of us in our tracks as we try to work our way through the bun skull and the man skull and we're getting prepared for the art test and all that kind of stuff. But going back to the richness of it, um, and, and, and to hear so many um, students, um, school children there, and they go to their Gaelic dictionary, their English-Irish dictionary, desperately looking for words for the naughty bits, and they don't find any. The Irish language doesn't seem to have words for the naughty bits. Mm, Is this the yeah, case? How I do. I remember doing that myself in school, and the great poet Noel Nirvana said she thought that there was no sort of sexual language in in the Irish language until she got married, and then she was invited into the back kitchen, and suddenly she realised there was an entire different. Um, vocabulary that the women, the old women, the old elder women, married women used among each other. So, like, I could start with the word like kyotog, which is an earthworm, or dulachin, or dulaman, or dulaman, which is a, uh, a form of um, a small suckable thing, or a channeled rack, 
or skedine, which is a small speck, speck or a driblet, or skibberline, which is a limp hanging thing, or arable tussig, which is a front tail, or scuhine, which is a little wisp of flask or hair or hemp, or scuhog, which is a tufted seaweed, or aenine, which is a little bird, or shiestanach, which is strips of wood. I could go on and on. All of these are actually words for penis. Bluchan, a wild carrot, is a word for a penis. Ferk, the hilt of a dagger, is a word for a penis. Machan, a tuberous root, is another word for a penis. Smachtin is a cudgel or a bludgeon or another word for a, for a penis. I could go on, I could give you so many words for, for the act of, um, of procreation. We could go budiach, clawing, boil, protoil, prosoil, uh, bula lahar, bula kraken, stylol, gawel. There are plenty, plenty. And there's no, there was no shame to any of these words in the Gweltach. You know, this idea of sexuality being, uh, being a shameful thing is a, you know, is a Victorian thing or a puritanical thing or a ma mainstream European thing. You know, whenever you go among tribal people in Africa or in, even in any sort of in South America, the same, the, the sexual act is not a thing of shame. The, the, the genetic, gen, genetic, the gen, genetical or, no, not genetical, the genital order or organs are not a thing of shame. And um, so th these words are used with absolute um, freedom among people. Now, it tends to be uh, men will use it among men and women will use their women. And I don't have access to the female words. And in fact, they haven't really been written down. I know some women now who are doing research on it, but um, they've just been kept to themselves. But the words were all there. And you'll still find, if you go to the Gweltacht, and if you're an outsider, the Gweltacht won't use, the, the native speaker in the Gweltacht won't use these words in front of you because they know they embarrass you. They don't embarrass them. And so it means all of the words for cursing in Irish, none of them are to do with, with sexuality or to do with, um, to do, yeah, with, you, with, with sort of wor words for, for, um, for your sexual organs. Because, as I said, they weren't insulting. Wow. They weren't taboo. That's absolutely fascinating. And that, that's really fascinating there. So I, what I'm hearing you say there is that actually by simply looking at the, at the richness of that particular vocabulary, we could perhaps maybe move ourselves back to back before that Victorian Puritanism that seems to have flattened so much of our actual lives up until recently. That's really lovely stuff to hear. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it just doesn't exist in the Gweltacht. I like there's the great um, Sean Mokatihig, uh, son of Danny, uh, nephew of Danny Sheehy, the great, um, he's an RTE television presenter and he is a writer and he's a great thinker. But he notices that he does reports, radio reports for Radio in the Gweltacht, the Irish language radio station, and for RTE television, uh, for the main television station, he'll do an Irish language report and then an English one. And he needs to entirely change what he's saying. He says there was no way he would be able to express things in the way he expressed them in Irish on the English channel. It is just, even today, they never took on the hang-ups. And we can, as you say, easily go back to that, to that easiness again. That's marvellous. That's really, really wonderful. Really, really wonderful. Shall I continue, Mike? Or is it just... You continue, yep. Because I mean, here's a question, of course, that, that uh, so many people are, are, are asking. The complexity of the language, the difficulty of learning the language. What is the reason for that? Why do my students have so much trouble? Why the huge number of people out there who would happily tomorrow pop a pill that would give them fluency in Ireland? They would queue up for it as if it were the vaccine. But unfortunately, when it comes to learning the damn thing, everything falls up. What is, is, is it especially hard? No, no, it isn't. Um, like the phonetics are quite easy. The spelling is a little bit complex, but you can get your head around that once you see what the GH and the DH are. But the phonetics are quite simple. They don't change, not half as much as in English. There are a lot less irregular verbs. Is there seven or 12 irregular verbs, you know, compared to countless ones in, um, mm. in English? Um, mm. The one thing that needs to be bear in mind, well, two things that make it compli complicated. First, there was no universal language you know, Gaelic language, Irish language until whatever, the 1940s, maybe even the 50s, you could say, there were dialects. And so each area had its own dialect. Mm -hmm. Each peninsula had its own dialect. The great anthropologist, um, E.S. Jen Evans from Wales, who taught up in, in Queen's University, he said, like, the Welsh uh, was a language, Welsh were a people of the valleys, and so it was a language of the valleys, and so it communicated, it was easy to move around the valleys, and their language remained more or less universal. Irish was, a, was pushed and pushed out to the peninsulas, the furthest points of these rocky prominence, 
promontories. So each air in each area, it, the language developed its own dialect. And so the people at the end of that promontory of that peninsula wouldn't meet the other ones. So that way is complicated. You, you can, if you're trying to learn Irish in Germany or in New York or in Canada, you're going to go to a class. And one week it could be someone from the Irish I have, from Gwelga Kirkurina, Gwelan Kirkurina, Gwelan is what we call it in West Kerry. And then in Donegal, it could be Gaelic, Gaelic, you know, Tirhonal, totally Tanga Umlan, totally different. But really, so that makes it complicated. But really, Joe, the thing is, it's a psychological um, bach, a psychological hindrance, so kunstak, a, a, a hurdle that we need to get over. So, you know, epigenetics is showing more and more that we remember trauma. So this language was the language for us until really the famine. And our, the parents of those people who survived the famine, of our ancestors realized it's got to end now. You need to forget this language. You need to get English. You need to get it very quickly. We have seen 70% of our community wiped out in places like Mayo. The only way you're going to survive is if you get out of here and get this language, the, the English language, into you very quickly. And, you know, it happened at the exact same time as 1831, the National Schools Act in Britain, where Britain started national schools in Ireland, and they started saying it has to only be English because, of course, the colonizer will always want you to to have the colonizer's language. So it's two things, the colonizer imposing the language, but then the local people who survived the famine, who survived the harsh hardship of centuries, you know, of, of, the, of your of babies dying, of, you know, very low um, lifespan. They're saying there is another way, get out of here and you need this language. Mm. That is still inside of us, Joe. Mm. It is mm. so strong. And we never address it. Mm. What do we do? We drink. We drink to break down that trauma. And what do we say when we drink? We say slide to. And what does slide to mean? It means help. You know, can we get healthy? Can we find put this darkness behind us? So the minute the minute we are told to speak this language again, we remember the trauma, not our minds, but our, the, the epigenetics, the memory in our DNA cells. And we will, we will not allow ourselves to learn. It's not a hard language, but there is clearly a deep block, a deep block to learning it. And we don't understand now why Russians and, and sort of, you know, uh, Chinese and Japanese will come to Ireland and they would just speak Irish. They would just get over it. It's just another language. It's not very complicated. But my God, there is so many hindrances. And when I realized that most was when I made that TV series called No Berlin, 2007 and 2008. And as you explained, I went around the country just trying to speak the Irish language. It was that simple. I thought it would just be a bit of fun. I had been living in West Kerry for a year at the time, only speak, only living my life through Irish. And I thought, what would happen if I stepped outside of the Gwaltot, the Irish speaking area, and did the same? And I arrived in Dublin. And on that first day, I went into McDade's and I got kicked out. I went into a shop, the sort of a main agency for a map shop in Dublin, and they blocked their ears. I was told to F off. I was, you know, just abused and kicked out and just um, insulted wherever I went. Only in Dublin. Outside of Dublin, it was fine. People didn't understand me, but they were polite. But anyway, I brought all that footage, the whole thing. We were using uh, hidden cameras for the whole thing. So we bring it back into the edit suite. And we plug it in to try and edit the program. And suddenly I can see from the hidden cameras, I can see into people's eyes. I can see deeply how they are reacting when I'm speaking Irish. And what do I see? I see this mix of fear, of envy, of regret, of love, of anger, of jealousy. We have such complex emotions about our language that it just, that gets in our way and it fogs the brain. And just, sorry, um, Rosalie just, uh, put in a uh, message. There are 11 irregular verbs in Irish according to standard, and I just checked online, and there are over 200 in English. Wow. So you're pretty well made. But the thing is, I mean, that whole idea, again, about that deep genetic shame, that generational shame of Irish, that English was the language you, is a colonizing language. English is a language when you, you know, as it were, arrive in Ellis Island and want your job and want to fit in. That's what you need. Irish is going to get you nowhere. I do wonder now, uh, totally acknowledging and agreeing with what you say, but we now have the kind of multi-generational shame that's moved forward from that. But probably again until the 1990s, the expectation of so many people growing up in well-topped areas, peripheral areas, non-urban areas, they were going to leave. So why grind through this old language is not going to get you your position on a you know, building site in Boston, a 
trading floor in Singapore, wherever it may be. And I just wonder now, in the contemporary world, are we suffering another battle that Irish does has to a degree recovered? It became fashionable, trendy. You look at T.G. Cahar, everybody presenting it's under 24. They're cool, they're beautiful, their Irish is beautiful. But do we not have a problem now within the sort of social media world, within the internet world, that if you're in the Connemara Gweltocht or the Kerry Gweltocht, you're not alone anymore. You're not just living in that kind of world of your locale, of your neighbours, friends, family, and as Gwelga, you're being bombarded and consuming your TikToks, your whatever, in English. Yeah. And is that yeah. now the big challenge at the moment? Yes, yes, it is. Um, so, you know, I say that idea of the language being to do with hardship was, as you said, up until we had we stopped having to emigrate. And, you know, we emigrated up until the 80s. And then the, the, the Celtic boom, you know, the Tijikar set up in 1996 because the country was suddenly flooded with money. And Fianna Fáil realised in their watch they couldn't allow with this extra surfeit of money. They couldn't not finally fund the television channel. But that was the time where the Irish pound became, it, in fact, it became more valuable than the English sterling. And suddenly Irish people relaxed. We realized, okay, it's not about survival anymore. We're okay. And so we had this, you know, that generation came along. We had Teach Car, we had SpongeBob SquarePants in Irish, we had Scooby Doo in Irish. We took on this new Irish language, and as you said, it became sexy, it became a thing of confidence. What we did lose, what we kept on losing, continued to lose, was the great vast wealth of the Irish in the Gweltops, which is very different from, you know, the Irish you hear on a television channel. Like mm -hmm. all of those words for, for stones or for a hole or for a field. Um, clearly weren't being used in, in, in Scooby-Doo or when they were translating Spongebob. Um, so, you know, we are now at this point so that the language in the last 30 years did grow hugely among the cities and there was no longer a shame. There was a pride actually among young people. Yeah. Now, as you say, the digital age has um, really affected Gweltoft's but something else is happening too. Again, we're only seeing in the last three years. And uh, for me, a good example is my book. Like I brought out a book in the Irish language. Gil, the publishers, realized, okay, it's a nice little book. We'll sell a bit for Christmas. We'll publish 5,000 copies. And uh, it'll probably be there for a year and a half. You know, it'll, 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 it'll do, it'll last the 5,000 copies a year and a half. We won't republish it. Within three days, it was sold out. No one had read it. So it wasn't because the book was good. You know, and they republished it and sold out. They, rep they republished it six times. You're seeing this with a lot of elements of Irish culture at the moment. This hunger that is happening, Irish people, and it's sort of to do with COVID, but it happened before that. We seem to be finally wanting a rootedness. We want a connection with something bigger. Just because all over around the world, everyone is feeling isolated. They are feeling broken and alienated. We are living in a world, as you say, of TikTok of um, non-rootedness, of absolute speed and change that we cannot even imagine. And we are going to our yoga mats to find meaning, which is okay, but you know, it's an alien thing. So more and more people now are turning back into themselves, onto themselves. And uh, they seem to be, you know, in Ireland there's this fixation with sea swimming and lake swimming and walking and cycling and, and, and running and planting, you know, planting vegetables. You cannot buy a seed for a lettuce or a courgette in Ireland at the moment. So as part of this, we seem to want that rootedness of a language that is timeless and is sustainable and is connected. And hope that might be the change that makes us respect the Gweltzuchts and realize that needs to be a sustainable place. And that'll require huge investment. And the more of us go there, as you say, it is diluting the language. So it's very, very complex, very complex. But I think the shift will be there. Well, you know, the last 30 years, what we've done, we've closed down the main industry of um, the Gweltochts, which were, which were small scale farming, which, you know, we've found, which is now in just uneconomic, and then fishing, which we, the government, um, per, you know, took all of their fishing rights away, far more than the EU would have imposed on them. So we have starved and killed them and put a few factories, Udros and Gweltochts, industrial factories into a place that has never had that working mentality. So maybe something more subtle and more sensitive will come along. I really love your diagnosis of the, of the present problem. And very few people are going to disagree with you there on this absence of rootedness, the, 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 the ephemerality 
of, of, of modern culture and that need to get down to, to the, the root. And your suggestion that perhaps we can get this through the Irish language is a is, is very, very powerful message. I just want to go back to the beginning of the state and you've explained quite well, I mean, through epigenetics that in fact it wasn't possible anyway. The language, those grand ideals of, of the people, of that revolutionary generation, with the, the, those aspirations that, that, that so many of us still continue to buy into. But in terms of the language, and perhaps in so much more, it actually failed. Were those people deluded at the time? Or was it simply because of, they didn't understand that, that the trauma that, that they were still living through? So that's my first question, if you can help me with that one. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it sort of brings up that issue uh, that Mike said, like, if we, they got it into our minds, our ancestors in the 19th century, they had to have English to survive, they had to leave. And as we know, right throughout the 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, the Irish still had to leave. There was no future for most of them. There was no economic prosperity. So you would have thought the language would have died out entirely. It should have, because you know, mm -hmm. after the famine, they stopped speaking it to their kids. Um, and the schools stopped speaking it. So the only way it survived was because, as you said, part of the dream of these beautiful poetical idealists in who founded the revolution was to bring to revive the Irish language, and they did it in such a in such a crass way, but almost as equally a crass as way as uh, or an idealistic and crass a way as I am now laying out, uh, you know, a more um, earth based sustainable future for me. Like so, it was my great grand uncle, you know, the O'Reilly, who founded the Volunteers. He chose Owen McNeill as a figurehead. He wanted a professor, a, Celtic, a professor of Celtic studies, because Owen, because the O'Reilly wanted violence. He wanted. He realised that. Was going to, you were going to need violence to foment a revolution. So he put a nice um, professor, an, acad an academic professor, as a figurehead, set up the, the um, volunteers, bought in the guns, used his own money, the huge amount of money his father had inherited, to buy the guns from the whole gun running, as well as money from a lot of other sources, of course. Um, and then he and my grandmother and his two sisters, my great-grandmother and my great-grandaunt, moved to the Blasket Islands in 1912. They didn't have a word of Irish, you know? Yeah. And they slept on the floor of Peg Sayers' house and of the King's house um, and Tomaso Crehan's house. The, so there was not only, there was the O'Reilly, his four children, his rich American heiress wife, Nancy Nanny Brown, filthy rich woman from New York. Um, you know, Anno, Madame O'Reilly, these very elegant women, uh, my great granddaughter to my great grandmother, and then my granny and her two brothers, all on the floors of these O'Reilly, uh, of the Blasket Island shacks on the island, learning the Irish, that, because they realised they were going to, but the O'Reilly understood he was going to have to learn to fight, buy in guns and train people. So he learned, he, he read all of the accounts of British military prowess to learn the techniques of British um, military strategy, train the people, and then he was going to have to fight and then to obviously de-anglicize, as Hyde said as well, learn the language too. And so we still, I still have some of the mistakes, the grammatical and word mistakes that my grandmother and the O'Reilly made when they were on the Blasket Islands. I'm still saying them because of course my grandmother pa passed on to me, like, like calling letter parashta, porridge, instead yeah. of the thing, and, and biscade for risky and things like that. Um, so, you know, it, that's a once in a lifetime um, mindset to think I am going to remake society and there was you know there were, clearly it wasn't only the O'Reilly there was a lot of them and there were people more important and more visionary than the O'Reilly um, and this their, their, the strength of their vision the sheer the sheer sh shutzpah carried it forward for 80 years but as you said when you only have a tiny handful of people who are thinking like that and the rest who are struggling on the land and have no time no space for big um abstract, vainglorious thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's interesting now with, with climate change, we are exactly in a similar place now where, you know, you are going to get these people with these big, vague ideas, like even Bill Gates' new book. And then how are the rest of us going to catch up with these big ideas when the rest of us are still just trying to pay off our mortgage? We don't have time for the big thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was very interesting. I mean, I did some work a few years ago on the autograph books from Post 16 um, in Kilmainham. And what was amazing was all those men and women who were in various prisons, prison camps around Ireland and Britain, was a number of them who clearly took great pride at Celtic script, etc., to 
having learned not just their name, but also a sort of very basic greeting, long live Ireland, whatever it may be, as Gwelga. But then you also see that frustration of them in the 20s when they have their state. The very people you're talking about, the people who are laboring on the land, trying to make a living, are not up to the task. You know, there's almost a frustration. What's wrong with them? We've delivered this dream to you, and yet you almost won't get with the program. But the next step is this Gaelicization and this complete rejection of an Anglo culture. Um, do you think that was ever a winnable battle? Because, you know, as you say, Bill Gates, whoever, the big dreamers, there is this real problem that unless you can convince five million people or how many you've got in a country to go with a big idea, it's incredibly difficult. Very difficult, yeah. So, you know, for the last two years, I've written a column for the Irish Times called One Change every fortnight, coming up with lovely ideas, one change for a sustainable world that we can implement in our lives. And they're lovely and neat, and some of them are very clever. It's exactly what Yora Halley was trying to do and Pierce with their little weekly articles of how to de-anglicise Ireland, or how my grandmother, Sheila Humphreys, when she was vice president of Common Amman, having all her Irish language lessons and her proverbs of the day and her little articles for the magazines. And, you know, the Yora was editor of and Clive Sullish putting out these stuff, these nice things. Whereas the majority, you know, you ask and, and, you know, people like me, I give lectures about how important the peatland is, the turf and how the richness, the ecological and botanical richness of it. You ask my neighbours around here in Westmead, they don't give a shit about that. They know they have harvested, they have exploited that resource all of their lives and nothing is going to stop them. In the same way, like one of my recent articles was, oh, how to stop idling in your car or, you know, I've now... I was a travel journalist for 20 years until last February when I announced in the Irish Times that I wasn't going to fly again for holidays anyway, maybe for work, but not for holidays. Now, people, obviously, that's a ridiculous concept. It's fine for me with my 14 solar panels and, you know, my little eggs and my turkeys and my hens and my bees, but I am living a dream. How does one get the majority into that idea? All I can say is... My book should not have sold six times. That should have sold out six times. People are swimming in the lake beside me here in Loch Lomond. Now, since we arrived on this island 10,000 years ago, nobody has ever swum in that lake in winter, ever. There's been two mad people, maybe, you know, crazy people. But that was all. Um, now there are 40 people there on a Sunday. There's 12 people every day. You know, Dublin, all of the coastline is hoarded with with people swimming whenever the guardie, whenever the police allow it. Something is happening among people. People are turning on. They're realizing, I don't trust the world anymore. I need to find rootedness in myself. And this idea, like all of those small places in Ireland where you get organic seeds or even non-organic vegetable seeds, there was a handful of us supporting those things. The fact that they, our future forest down in Cork, the main place for buying trees, they open for half an hour a week and they are bombarded. You know, something is happening that is utterly illogical, that has never happened before. So possibly our only chance is a, a change of consciousness and maybe it's arising. And the one other proof I'd give you with regard to this is the, the female, the feminine. My book, I think has about four chapters on the Kailach. Now I know I am unqualified to talk about women. I do not understand a female understanding of the world. Um, I am limited by my penis, by my male view of the world, okay? But what I'm realizing is that the Irish language is an absolute female language. I can give you so many examples. It looks at the world from a feminine perspective. What we now know about, um, and our, you know, our history, what was the, all those Neolithic sites, those people before us, was all about the female goddess, the bandia, the dagda, the good god, and then the sun, the male impregnate, impregnating it and creating this, this, this sustainable, fertile essence. Now, what seems to be happening is our own, the only way we're going to get out of this, um, of, this, of this climate change conundrum is by going back to that more passive way of living on the earth. You know, we're going to think of male solutions first, of sucking out the carbon, of doing this, but they're probably not going to work. Like the great example is the bogs. You know, these bogs that were the great, the great sinkers of carbon for thousands of years, uh, hundreds of thousands of years. Also, the great, the great wombs of the earth that kept all of our 
um, of all of our pollen, pollen samples for 20,000 years alive, that kept our bog, bog bodies alive, that kept our manuscripts alive, that nourished us in the small amount we took them. And then along comes the O'Rahilly's son, Aegon O'Rahilly, my, whatever, my cousin. Um, he was one of the founders of Board Nimona. And they, after the Second World War, they bring out those massive machines and basically they rape the bog. You know, we bring out our big, just like the Maharajas in India had their big phallic elephants and then their Rolls Royces as the, the male member that controls the land. And so we raped the, the bog. We know these things are not viable it's, anymore. It's shocking when things actually of all of the, all of the bog bodies and all of the history that just went into those machines and was crunched up and we burnt it away. That's, it's a terrifying thing, actually. Gilor Keshtin and Shaw, Kenwano, Aidan Fitzpatrick, a consist fate of Jershila Mitchin Hain or Gidhain Ian of Conagail Gokinal Bio. So he's wondering, actually, if there's a specific couple, one or two small things that the ordinary person can do to help to keep the Irish language alive. Any mm -hmm. small things? Yeah. Um, it's, so it's not, we know now, it's not about education so much. It's not about the government, particularly in Ireland. It's just about talking it, the Irish language, in, in the public sphere. So either setting up little, you know, either saying a few words of Irish, or if you have a few words of Irish, meet in a coffee shop when that's allowed again. Meet in your local library and just start talking, talking it. So there's lovely resources on the internet now, but if we can take it into the real world, because the minute other people hear Irish spoken, like a year ago, we would never have imagined that it was normal to wear a mask. Now you don't take a second look because everyone else is doing it. If we were hearing Irish around us, we would. It would, it would so the answer good. out there is is to be brave. Say a mark, August be a lowered. Go go and yeah. talk in there. August catch that on 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 Eden uh, Kilna, and he says if you're not lowered, we star in the psychedelics in there in Orsa. So we're not going to go into that. Eden would like to hear you tell us about uh, the history of um, of psychedelics in Irish, which is a question I see Richard Carney here too that he's also interested in it. And I don't know that we're going to quite get to it, but a couple of catch that a few of the other uh, points that people make here and questions they ask is um uh, would love to hear to hear answer that question there uh, look at the way look at the way here's one that we've heard obviously Clar arrayed our uh, tj Cahar. there was a program last night you can watch on tj car about peg sayers the much 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 disliked peg say look at the way says donna morgan he says look at the way peg was beaten into a school book just not suitable for school children at least Peg is being redeemed. Just a quick answer to that or any point you'd like to make about Peg and, and, and that imposition of Peg. So, you know, obviously my grandmother knew Peg well and my mother knew her too. And my mother used to say she was just so naughty. She was hilarious and so ribald and bold and dirty, you know. So clearly she, she cleaned herself up a bit when she knew she was being, the words were being transcribed. But of course then her son, Michal Goheen, you know, cleaned it up again. And then other editors after that. So have basically denatured, dehumanized her, humanized her. It was unfortunate that that was the book that was given to school children. There are far more appropriate books for school children. But Peg was a powerful, strong woman character. And maybe, maybe one of the reasons that men didn't like it is we just didn't like a woman who had such strong opinions and knew her mind and was willing to lambaste people when she needed to. Yeah, Garmaga, the point here from Marcus, Marcus Breen, the which Marcus, and he says he just, not correcting you, he says, but it'd be more accurate, he says, to suggest that it was the introduction of Christianity to Ireland that brought shame to a reference to sexuality in the human body rather than the Victorians there. The latter raised shame to the level, he says, of horror in reference to the body. I think that you would agree yeah. with that here. And uh, Rob asked a question, not unlike the one we had in, and that was, do you agree that Irish being compulsory in schools damages the future of the language? Damaged in the past is damaging the present. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean... Yeah, my only, my, uh, the, the only way I see a hope is if basically it's an energetic change. And so, you know, so far we've been looking at either tinkering with the education system or the government, and they haven't worked. So, as you say, whether compulsory or non-compulsory, um, yeah, if, we, if we don't make it compulsory, 10 years ago, I would have said no one would have learned it. Really, you know, no one was interested except a tiny minority. If it looks like there is this feeling this movement arising in people again to connect with their heritage then and people will those who are interested will learn and actually then definitely we can not make we we shouldn't make it compulsory i suppose even even without it yeah compulsory is not the answer 
But my fear was that 10, 10 or 20 years ago, had it not been compulsory, it would be gone by now. Come here. Um, um, sorry, Mike, please. No, no, I was just going to go back. I mean, you, you talked there about the kind of destruction of the bogs and basically extractive industry um, and the whole problems of extractive industry with the history of masculinity, etc. But to focus in on you, the one thing I was fascinated by was your uh, house you built out of straw bales and mud. Um, but more particularly the idea that on your land you planted a thousand trees. Now that's a, as you said, that kind of one step at a time. A thousand trees is a big state. Why yeah, is that I so probably, important to you? I probably planted maybe 18,000 trees, I think. What I did was... I was, as I said, life didn't make sense to me when I was young. I was, you know, I had these, this, I was able to have this other world, this imaginative world of sort of beings or spirits, but I didn't make sense. So what happens when you're 18 or 19, you feel like that, you get depressed. And I didn't know what I was going to do with the world. And I realized if I planted trees, uh, the world made sense to me. So the minute I moved back after all my travels to Ireland, to Westmead, bought myself 10 acres because my granny, God love her, died and left me 10 grand. So I bought 10 acres here in Westmead and I just started planting trees. And the amazing thing about planting trees in Europe is, of course, the government, the European, the EU pay you to plant trees and they pay you for the next 15 years for growing those trees. They give the money to the government and then the government give it to you. So... I now started 20 years ago and I have this full oak forest beside me. I mean, all around me, which I now use for the, for the stove to, to heat my house in winter. And I use, um, I'm like, I'm felling some of the logs to build this, this little, um, this little hut. So yeah, it just, it made sense to me that, you know, trees can grow so quickly, particularly in a place like Ireland. And we can, it was just a way of being, of making life sustainable. Um, Monica, and as I'm looking at some of the comments and questions here, indeed the word inspiring comes up time and time again. And indeed, I mean, what you're doing and what you've done is absolutely inspiring. I want a quick question there is, is uh, what is a realizable goal? You're a dictator, you're in charge of our, it's a realizable goal for the Irish language, you know, over the next 50 years. What, yeah. what can we hope for? What might be done? It, so I'm now working on a book about landscape. And it's doing the same what I wanted for the language. And what I wanted for the book about the language is how can we see the insights the language can give us into our culture, into our psyche, into the other world, and basically into, into our internal world. I believe that the same we can do for landscape. This landscape, if we get to feel it and know it, will not only tell us about our past, our heritage, will show us sustainable ways of living bountifully on this land and will open up our psyche into a different way because we're we can't just take away the language and look at it all by itself what's happening is that people all over the world are lost and wounded and want connection everybody needs to go back to something we can all go and find sanskrit and find meaning in in yoga if we want to but all of us should maybe find some culture that is in our own dna and if we're going to do that take those steps towards understanding the Irish way of life, the Irish culture, the Irish mythology, the Irish language, all of it comes as a point. And it's not about going into the past, and it's definitely seeing through the dark elements of that culture, the limit, limitedness of that culture, and the, the backward things, but taking the things that are important and using that to build a sustainable, flourishing, healthy, healthy future. That's really, 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 really beautiful. Can I just say, actually, before we finish that um, a lot of your programs including your absolutely marvelous historical documentary about the 17th century actually are available on tg account and that's available all over the place tg4 tg account will give you so much of monica's really wonderful stuff and what you've just been saying there seems to be tapping into a number of questions that we've had there particularly from roshin dove there and shin and that's to say is that your books actually would perhaps be as good a way as people can find to 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 do their little bit towards the future in the irish language and look that's the one on shin 32 words for field and perhaps 170 words for penis thrown in for nothing as well. And this is the lovely one, C. Tamagotchi. And that's only one of the many books that are available actually from Monica, and all of which are inspiring and 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 really on all in your fad. So Gurmil Mahagat and so just to say, Joe, on, there's please. two there's, there's two free things. You know, every single day I put out a word, a, an Irish word for me, the C. Tamagotchi, a coastal word, a unique coastal word that gives us an insight into our coast 
are I'll also words from the from the books. For, so for the next two months, there'll be coastal words. You'll find it on Instagram at Moncon McGann. You'll find it on Twitter at, at Moncon McGann. You'll find them on my website as well. And each of these words, there's a, for the whole of the month of March, every day there's a film to go with each word to really give you a sense of how these words open up boxes to show you the world in new ways. And I'm just putting that in there uh, now. And Mike, do you want to tell us about what we have coming up next week? Sure. Uh, next week, we are, uh, again, uh, towards the end of St. Patrick's Week, I suppose, um, we're going to be talking to um, a very active man in Irish culture, I suppose, cultural affairs in the last few years, um, the Irish ambassador to the United States, Dan Mulhall, um, who's been around the world. Uh, he's been in Asia as a diplomat. He's been in London during the Brexit talks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And obviously, he had his years in um, <clears throat> the U.S. working uh, in the ferment that was Donald Trump's America. Um, but obviously, has emerged more recently very close to uh, President Biden. But clearly, somebody who's leveraged for all the work he does uh, has leveraged Irish culture as a way of speaking to uh, not just Irish America but um, uh, America generally. Um, so he's going to be joining us next Friday. Uh, 9.30 Irish time, uh, 4.30 American time. Go to Eventbrite, look at Boston College Irish Influence, where we've also put all the events for the next five, six weeks, I think, if you want to get tickets for those, or just come back to the Zoom address. So that's next week. Excellent. Excellent. Go Mil Margot, Mike. Go Mil Margot. Uh, agus thank, you. Agus, uh, thank you all very, very much for being here. I have just put up there uh, Monacan's at Monacan again, and you can follow him. And um, lovely, look forward to seeing you all next week. That was just great. Thanks, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.